But then this afternoon, uh, the New York Times published a freaking 40 page long, 13,000 word, mind bending expose um, about the president, specifically about his money and how he got it, which turns out to be a 180 degree different story than the president's own account of how he made his money. This story also potentially implicates the president in pretty substantial um, fraud and tax evasion. So, I mean, okay, everybody on the, on the staff here on this show, we now have these little poker chips. Um, our show just had our 10 year birthday, which we were very happy about. It's a big milestone for us, right? Nobody makes it to 10 years. And to, su to, to celebrate, my sweetie, Susan, uh, bought all of us these little poker chips. Can I, if I hold one up, can we show it on this camera? Can we show it there? Yeah, there we go. Look, it can even focus. So it says the Rachel Maddow show on one side, and on the other side it says, lucky 10, because we made it to 10 years. It's very sweet, right? So this is sort of our staff present for turning 10. I love it. Uh, and it turns out tonight, it wouldn't take long, they helped tell this story. All right, <clears throat> December 1990, Donald Trump owns a casino called the Trump Castle in Atlantic City. He has done a very bad job running that casino. He has uh, way overspent on renovations, otherwise dumped way more cash into it than the business could keep up with. And on December 17th, 1990, his casino, the Trump Castle, needed to make a payment, a multi-million dollar interest payment on a big loan they had taken out for that failing casino. Just hours before that payment was due, it really looked like Trump was not going to make it, which would have dire consequences. And so his dad, who was then 85 years old, sent a bag man to this casino, to Donald Trump's casino in Atlantic City. Uh, the, the dude he sent, his name was Howard Snyder, walked into Trump's casino in Atlantic City. He went up to the cage where all the cashiers work on the casino floor, and he handed them a check for $3.35 million. The cashiers verified that the check was good, and the casino promptly handed over to Howard Snyder a big pile of poker chips. Here you go. Each worth $5,000. $3.3 million worth of poker chips. Howard Snyder took those poker chips, put them in a bag, and left. He did not play poker with them. He did not gamble with them. He just took the poker chips away. Apparently the next day, it turned out that that $3.35 million wasn't enough. Donald Trump's still in trouble, still not gonna make the interest payment. Trump's dad the next day wired another $150,000 to that casino. Once again, they checked that the wire was good. The money was there from Trump's dad. They issued another $150,000 in poker chips. $5,000 a chip. Dude, picked them up, put them in a bag. Did not gamble with those chips. He just took them and he left the building. Poker chips are awesome. Take it from me, I now have a new habit of playing with them all the time now because we have them for the show as little tchotchkes. They're fun. But in December 1990, Donald Trump's dad spent 3.35 and then another 150, so $3.5 million. Just buying a big bag of these that he got to take home. And they're neat, but they don't actually have integral value unless you're gonna spend them at the casino. He just got a big bag of chips and left with it. Three and a half million dollars worth. That was illegal. <laughs> but it was also handy in the moment when Donald Trump was up against that big deadline from the bank. That three and a half million dollars in that moment, it sort of ostensibly looked like gambling income for the casino that came in just in time so the casino could make its interest payment. Of course, it wasn't gambling income for the casino. It was just Donald Trump's dad transferring three and a half million dollars to his son without paying any taxes on it to bail his son out so he could pay off the bank. Ultimately, they actually got caught for that by gambling regulators. They had to pay a $65,000 fine for having pulled off that scheme with the poker chips that they did not gamble with. But in the end, though, $65,000 fine, who cares? Small potatoes, right? The whole scheme worked. And this is one of many anecdotes uh, that the New York Times recounts today about how Donald Trump's entire business life has been bankrolled to spectacular effect by his dad, which he has always denied. I mean, this anecdote about the poker chips is actually one that, that we've seen reported before. Actually, shortly after it happened, this happened in December 1990, the Wall Street Journal wrote a story about it in January of 1991. And it's interesting, there's even a little bit of foreshadowing for all of us in the way that story was initially reported. Wall Street Journal broke the story about the poker chip scheme and Donald Trump's dad's bag man in, in January of 1991. 
a few months later, by that summer, the Wall Street Journal had actually taken that reporter off the Donald Trump beat. Because unbeknownst to the editors at the Wall Street Journal at the time, that reporter had once taken some boxing tickets off Trump. Tickets specifically to the Evander Holyfield George Foreman fight that year in Atlantic City. Editors at the Wall Street Journal found out that their reporter had done that, had taken those tickets, when Trump himself called the editors of the paper to complain about their negative news coverage of him. Having compromised this reporter by slipping him some boxing tickets that he'd have to keep secret from his bosses, Trump then dropped the guillotine, right? He narked that reporter out to his editor for taking the tickets, and then he got that dude taken off the Trump reporting beat. Blech! <laughs> right? It's gross. Like, both the story that they were initially reporting on and that kind of management of the press thereafter, I mean, that was 1990, 1991, but that's the bubbling toxic stew we all live in now when it comes to covering not just this presidency, but the federal government that he now controls. What the Times has documented in this new blockbuster piece of reporting on Trump's finances is that that scummy little anecdote when Trump's dad sends in a bag man to illegally and secretly bail out his son and evade taxes, that was not a one-off. That was, that was emblematic of a pattern and indeed a plan that shows us a wildly different story about the president's wealth and his business history than anything that he has ever admitted to publicly. It also appears to implicate him, as I mentioned, in tax evasion, fraud and other potential criminal behavior. Part of the reason this behavior and this larger pattern of the president's financial history hasn't come to light before now um, is because the Times somehow for this story obtained hundreds of thousands of previously unseen documents from the Trump family and their businesses and their financial entities. No, they still did not get Donald Trump's personal tax returns, uh, but they apparently did get his dad's. And reams and reams and reams of family business documents, both from public sources and also apparently from private files. So that's one reason this story has never come to light before. This documentation has never been used for journalistic purposes before. But the other reason this story about Trump's financial history hasn't really been told before, at least not in this level of detail, is because of what the Times quite candidly describes as the history of Trump getting uncritical press coverage, particularly around his finances. He has not been a financial genius. He has not been a great deal maker. He has not been a great business mind, but he has been great at convincing the credulous press to describe him as such over a period of decades. And that big blustery PR effort was effective at disguising this blatant con that he played on the public for years, pretending to be some kind of self-made millionaire or even self-made billionaire, when apparently he really isn't anything of the sort. Here's the lead from the Times tonight, quote, President Trump participated in dubious tax schemes during the 1990s, including instances of outright fraud that greatly increased the fortune he received from his parents. Mr. Trump won the presidency proclaiming himself a self-made billionaire, and he's long insisted that his father provided almost no financial help. But the Times' investigation, based on a vast trove of confidential tax returns and financial records, reveals that Mr. Trump received the equivalent today, the, excuse me, received the equivalent today of at least $413 million from his father's real estate empire, starting when he was a toddler and continuing to this day. Quote, in every era of Mr. Trump's life, his finances were deeply intertwined with and dependent on his father's wealth. By age three, Mr. Trump was earning $200,000 a year in today's dollars from his father's empire. He was a millionaire by age eight. Soon after Mr. Trump graduated from college, he was receiving the equivalent of a million dollars a year from his father. The money increased with the years to more than $5 million annually in his 40s and 50s. Fred Trump, Donald Trump's father, was relentless and creative in finding ways to channel his wealth to his children. He made Donald not just his salaried employee, but also his property manager, his landlord, his banker, and his consultant. He gave him loan after loan, many of which were never repaid. He provided money for his car, money for his employees, money to buy stocks, money for his first Manhattan offices, and money to renovate those offices. He gave Donald Trump three trust funds. He gave him shares in multiple partnerships. He gave him $10,000 checks at at Christmas time, he gave him laundry revenue from his buildings. 
But being a young man who was just living off his dad's considerable wealth, just being on the receiving end of his dad's, his dad giving him tons and tons of money and paying for everything in his life, that apparently was not the public image that Trump wanted for himself or that Trump's dad wanted for his son. And so the selling of a contrary and untrue public image about Donald Trump himself being some sort of self-made business maven, that is something that Trump orchestrated, but the press really helped him out. He couldn't have done it without them. Um, and this is where the Times gets very candid, even about its own role in this part of the public lie of Donald Trump. Quote, He's tall, lean, and blonde with dazzling white teeth, and he looks ever so much like Robert Redford. He rides around town in a chauffeured silver Cadillac with his initials DJT on the plates. He dates slinky fashion models, belongs to the most elegant clubs, and at only 30 years of age estimates that he is worth more than $200 million. So began a November 1, 1976 article in The Times, one of the first major profiles of Donald Trump and a cornerstone of decades of myth-making about his wealth. How could he claim to be worth more than $200 million when he would divulge later to casino regulators that his taxable income that year in 1976 was actually $24,594 for the whole year? But The Times in 1976 apparently bought it hook, line, and sinker, and then they turned around and sold it to the public. Quote, in the chauffeured Cadillac, Donald Trump took the Times' as reporter on a tour of what he called his, quote, jobs. He told her about the Manhattan Hotel he planned to convert into a Grand Hyatt. His father guaranteed the construction loan. He told her the Hudson River Rail... He took her to the Hudson River Railroad Yards that he planned to develop. The rights were purchased by his father's company. He showed the reporter, quote, our philanthropic endeavor, the high rise for the elderly in East Orange, New Jersey. That too was bankrolled by his father. Also an apartment complex on Staten Island, which was owned by his father. What he called their, quote, flagship, Trump Village in Brooklyn. That too was owned by his father. And finally, Beach Haven Apartments, which were also owned by his father. Quote, even the Cadillac was leased by his father. But he didn't talk about his father's ownership of any of those things. He passed it all off as his own. And then he boasted to the Times and they dutifully printed, quote, so far I've never made a bad deal. As the Times concludes today, now knowing that everything he was passing off as his own was actually owned by his dad, as the Times concludes today, quote, it was a spectacular con. And they've got all this detailed reporting that just makes the story get worse and worse and worse. Uh, quote, weeks after the Times' profile ran, Fred Trump set up still more trusts for his children, seeding each with today's equivalent of $4.3 million. Even in the early 80s, when Trump was already proclaiming himself to be one of America's richest men, he was still on his father's payroll, drawing an annual salary of $260,000. Meanwhile, Fred and his companies also began extending large loans and lines of credit to Donald Trump. Consider 1979, when he borrowed in January from his dad $1.5 million. In February, $65,000. In March, $122,000. In April, $150,000. In May, $192,000. In June, $226,000. In July, $2.4 million. And in August, $40,000. He borrowed all of that money, month after month after month after month, all from his dad. Quote, in theory, the money had to be repaid. In practice, records show many of these loans were more like gifts. But the, the, the column of... of bundled nerves that runs down the spine of this story uh, is not just that Trump took over $400 million from his father and lied for decades about having built some sort of business empire on his own when really what he was doing for decades was just cashing his dad's checks. The, the stuff that rings like a bell in this reporting, not just for what you might have thought about Donald Trump in the past, but for him now, it's not just about the lying and the false public persona that became his political persona when he decided to turn it into that. The tough stuff here is about crime. It's about potential criminal fraud and criminal tax evasion and being on the hook for that even now. That's next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.